everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every week, photographers from all over the country meet here to connect, inspire, and create. Our guests share their tips and teach us new techniques that help us improve our photography skills. The schedule for our upcoming presentations is on my website at lindanickel.com. Tonight's guest is Chris Burke. Chris is a cinematographer and photographer with West Folk Film Company based here in Austin, Texas. In tonight's presentation, Cinematography, Intro to Narrative Storytelling, Chris will talk about the many decisions, tools, and opportunities that you'll navigate while developing how to capture a visual narrative. Whether you're a stills or motion shooter, exploring these topics will add value and depth to your images. If you're on Instagram, look for him at Chris Burke, and you can connect with him at West Folk Film Company, and I'll link that website in the show notes. Welcome to the Happiness Hour, Chris. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me, and I, you, you're great at this. I think you should just be leading this whole thing. It makes <laughs> sense now, so... Yeah, I appreciate you reaching out and, and having me. I'm excited to kind of nerd out with y'all for a bit and talk through this. Well, I'm happy to have you. So um, like when we, uh, I disclosed that I found you on Instagram and that's how I found find a lot of my speakers. And I can't tell you what made me land on your page, but as I was digging through, I thought, hmm, I really want to have somebody that has the um, commercial experience that you do. And I was digging through and I really couldn't tell if you were just, you know, a freelancer or you own West Folk uh, Film Company or how that worked. And so can you just kind of give us a little bit of your background so people get a feel for what you do and how you got here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I started out, actually my dad's on Zoom right now. I started out kind of stealing the video camera out of his closet uh, when I was probably 12 or so. Um, most of it was film and skate videos. And so my buddies and I would go out and shoot all day and then at night crowd around the computer and edit. And at the time, I guess, Windows Movie Maker and eventually Final Cut Pro 7 and yada, yada. Um, and so I think the the kind of action of getting to find a compelling way to frame something that everyone else was there and saw it too, but you try and find a way to see it differently. And then the kind of community aspect of everyone gathering around the computer at night uh, and getting to see kind of the uh, the efforts that you put together and turning just video footage into an actual edit and trying to find a story there. Uh, that was just super compelling to me. And taking that through school, I studied in a couple of different schools. Um, so first I went to Columbia College in Chicago. And uh, you know, I've been raised in just north of Dallas my whole life. And so it was, it was a bit cold. And uh, so I came back to, to Texas and studied photography at St. Edwards. And then did my final two years studying film at UT Austin. Uh, so it stuck around in Austin. It's just kind of made sense to be here ever since. Uh, and yeah, my, my wife and I, Brittany and I run uh, West Folk Film Co. And it's, as Linda said, a primarily commercial film and photography production company. And uh, we kind of, as of late, have been trying to steer more towards the outdoor and adventure um, types of brands, focus on sustainability. And so I know visually that kind of falls in line with a lot of the, the shooters in this chat right now that are, you know, out there shooting landscapes and wildlife and flowers and birds. And uh, we've got a great appreciation for all those things. So hopefully this is a feels like a great crowd to be chatting with. Um, I think our interests are certainly aligned, but yeah, I guess that's a, a rough how we got here. It's not. It's not. I hope your dad is sitting there going, you know. I'm not mad at him for stealing my camera, <laughs> sneaking out with it because um, I, you know, and I'll stick your website in the chat and you've got it in there too. Um, but I'm going to encourage everybody to click on that link because when I was flipping through it, I thought, I just can't tell if this is work of one person or work for of a lot of people. Your resume is quite, quite impressive. And um, I'm tickled to have you here. And I appreciate you taking a blind invitation to some from someone you don't know. And um, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you and let you get started. Um, so yeah, this is a as Linda mentioned, it's kind of an intro to narrative storytelling. And there 
there are so many different ways that we could take this. Uh, and so I'm really trying to kind of maintain a high altitude perspective on this so we can share enough to get you all excited, but not overwhelmed. Uh, but again, I, I nerd out about this stuff and I could talk for days and go down rabbit holes. So feel free to hop on your microphone and stop me uh, or drop any note in the chat. If you want me to kind of go back and revisit something or simplify, I'm happy to do that. Um, so to touch on a little bit of this, um, but who the heck is this guy? Uh, so in general, as Linda again mentioned, I'm Chris Burke, founder of Westbrook Film Co. Uh, by trade, I'm primarily a DP and photographer as well as editor and colorist. I was born in Midland out in West Texas, raised north of Dallas in Plano, and currently living in Austin. Uh, my wife and I actually have our first kid on the way, and so that's also why my dad's here helping me put together the nursery, so that's exciting. Uh, but in the meantime, we've got that goofy looking dog down in the bottom right, a little red healer corgi mix. Uh, and again, I love answering questions, so please uh, feel free to stop me at any time. Uh, so here's a, a little bit of a portfolio. It's kind of a blend of stills and, and video. Um, the One of the things that's really compelling to me about commercial work you know, obviously, when I got into film, my passion was on the narrative side, short films, feature films, you know, music videos, but uh, that doesn't always pay the bills. And so I kind of had to dive more into the commercial world. And I found a, a really fun kind of aspect of that where as a shooter, I think the more and more you shoot, you'd start to develop your own visual style, hopefully, or at least that's what we all kind of convince ourselves we're doing. Uh, but once you start to work with a brand, you have to find a way to still keep your aesthetic, but also mirror theirs and find a way to create assets that are, you know, that they'll blend in alongside their other pre-existing assets that other people have shot. Um, and so it's a really unique challenge, I think, to where I might shoot more often, kind of like this moody shot of the nose of that Defender truck. Um, I really like low-key lighting and moody and shadows. Uh, I love being able to kind of control what the viewer is introduced to and what you might be hiding. I just think that's a, a really cool duality that you can play on uh, with shadow and light. However, that's not what all our clients want. For example, on the top left, you know, Toyota wants really bright and high key or on the bottom middle, uh, that kind of overhead shot is for Everly Low, which is a medical client and they want bright and clean. Uh, and so again, working with these different clients, it's like every time there's a new client, you got to put on, a bit of a different visual mask and find a way to still impose your style, but do it in a way that really aligns with their brand and their needs. Um, so ended up finding kind of a passion for the commercial world that I, I wasn't quite expecting. Um, so when we kind of ran through this as well uh, with the class summary, so I won't touch on it too much, but um, you know, a lot of these things that y'all have mastered as photographers, are the same tools that translate over into video, but when we apply them to video, they're done very differently. Um, and that's really just due to adding that motion aspect of things because you know, with still photos, we're really focused on that one frame. However, with video, you know, when we're shooting for movies, it's 24 frames a second. So finding ways to compel uh, you know, an audience and instead of just focusing on one composition or moving a camera through space or racking focus throughout a shot. Um, you know, there's lighting cues and changes that can be automated. So there's a, a whole world of things that opens up once we introduce motion into those techniques that y'all already know is still photography. Um, so we're gonna be diving into a couple of those. So a cinematographer, um, that's a term that a lot of us hear, you know, around Oscar season, uh, but it, it's a big confusing words. People think the word cinnamon is in there somewhere or no one really knows exactly what it is. Um, but to break it down simply, a cinematographer or a DP, a director of photography, that's the same uh, term. Uh, but what do they do exactly? So first and foremost, uh, the cinematographer is responsible for bringing a director's vision to life on screen while handling all the technical aspects of visual storytelling. So in theory, that means everything from choosing the camera, film stock, lenses, aspect ratio, lighting, camera movement, composition, shot list, et cetera, and working alongside your gaffer, who's kind of your head of lighting. Um, you work with that whole crew and take the director's vision and translate it to the visual world. Um, so these are some really extraordinary folks over on the right-hand side that are doing incredible things in the industry now. And some of the people I look 
look up to most. Um, and I can dive into some of those people later on if anyone wants to nerd out about them. But a lot of the blockbuster films you've seen are done by these folks, or these are, are some folks that are kind of climbing the ladder in an unusual way and, and breaking rules and getting some really amazing effects out of that. So the trifecta that we'll focus on, again, these are probably pretty familiar to you. Um, exposure, lighting, and composition and camera movement kind of go hand in hand when we're, when we're discussing motion. Uh, so at first we're gonna just go through the technicalities of what those three tools look like when we're using video. And then after we have an understanding of that, we'll figure out how we can apply those tools and make decisions to tell a visual narrative. Um, and again, if I need to slow down or anything like that, feel free to, to hop in. Um, so exposure, this is our, our first tool. And you'll also notice that a lot of these things kind of intertwine within each other, like exposure is you know, kind of a byproduct of how we're lighting and lighting is a byproduct of how we expose. Um, so there's a little bit of overlap, but I've tried to kind of keep them separate. And so take a quick swig of water real quick. So with exposure, um, you know, there's a couple key things that kind of define how we're going to achieve our exposure. And the first thing that's most noticeable in going from still photography to video is talking about frame rate. And frame rate is how many photos per second you're showing. Um, so as a photographer, y'all are very familiar with that. However, when we translate over to video, there's a few technical notes to keep in mind. Um, so when you go to the movies, you've probably noticed there's a difference between soap operas and a movie. There's just something that's kind of intangible. It's hard to exactly put your finger on it. Um, but the difference that you're seeing with the soap operas that feel really smooth and almost like home video versus a cinematic movie is movies are shot in 24 frames per second and old TV or things like soap operas or sometimes sports are shot in 30 frames per second. Uh, and, you know, that's only a difference of six photos per second that your eye is seeing or the TV is playing. It really doesn't sound like that much, but it makes a tremendous difference. Um, and so just for a quick note, most of what we'll talk about today is 24 frames per second, which, again, not to get too nerdy, but it's 23.976. There's a whole reason for that, but it's not important right now. Uh, but just to know, instead of shooting the home video look, when we're shooting cinematically, we really want to stick to 24 frames per second because that'll match that movie look that we're, we're used to seeing in theaters. Here's kind of an example uh, to break it down. So on this left-hand side, we see the difference between 60 frames per second, which is it's capturing 60 photos every second versus 24. And, you know, scientifically on the right side, if you look at that, ball kind of jumping back and forth on the screen you would think we want it to be that smooth transition because it's a little more comfortable for your eye to see than down low where it's kind of more staccato and punctuated um but there's a certain thing that happens it's i think it's kind of a, a magic of cinema where by shooting 24 frames per second there's just enough removal from reality that allows us to buy into the narrative or the story a little bit more um you know, we also benefit from it because in between some of those frames where it's not as smooth or there's a little motion blur, we're hiding things like cosmetic additions or scene backdrops or things like that. Um, so as filmmakers, we really benefit from 24 frames per second because we're able to hide a little bit more of the magic or, or the kind of illusions that we, uh, we often employ in cinema. But more of the story, this is uh, a simple diagram just to help understand that when we're talking about frame rate, that's just how many photos per second the camera's set to capture. So while we do shoot 24 frames per second uh, in film and commercial and music videos, there's still definitely reasons to shoot in 30 frames or 60 frames, or a lot of cameras shoot even 120 frames or 5,000 frames per second, uh, which is insane. Um, but two of the reasons that we'd shoot higher than 24 frames per second is one viewing at a higher frame rate for smooth surreal playback, which is this top example here. Um, if you wanted that kind of effect, like how, the reason that some people shoot higher frame rates in sports is because it feels lifelike. It feels like you're there seeing the players on the field. Um, but for cinema that it just doesn't feel right. We've been trained to see films in 24 frames per second. 
Um, so one benefit is if you wanted that smooth surreal playback to create a desired effect. But the main reason that we typically shoot in a higher frame rate, like 60 frames per second or 120 frames per second, is because we can take those 120 frames and play them back at 24 frames per second, which sounds confusing, but essentially um, I was going through metaphors with my dad to try and think of the best way to, to explain this. But if you imagine you had a flip book and you drew five photos of someone running, you'd flip through that pretty quick and you'd see a running motion very quickly. But if you drew that same amount of running over 120 photos, it would take you a while to flip through that and the running would be drawn out in much more slow motion. Uh, so by capturing at you know 120 frames per second and only playing back 24 of those every second, you're essentially stretching out a clip. Um, so again, the moral of the story is the only reason that in cinema we'd shoot a higher frame rate is to go slow motion. Uh, and 60 frames per second is a very common one, either because 48 frames per second is uh, half speed, essentially, because we're usually shooting at 24. So if you shoot in 48, it'll play back half as fast, or 60 is about a time and a half um, slower than, than real time or how, how life typically plays out. Um, and the reason that I'm bringing up frame rate when we talk about exposure is because shutter speed comes into play. Um, and y'all are very familiar with shutter speed. Um, and so in film, there's something called 180 degree shutter, uh, which goes back to a mechanical mechanism and film cameras, but we still kind of base our, our exposure and our frame rates today off of that because again, our eye has been trained for for decades and decades to be used to a certain amount of motion blur when we watch movies. Um, so to kind of understand what 180 degree shutter means, whenever you're shooting at a certain frame rate, um, you know, if you're shooting at 24 frames per second, that means there's a photo being taken every 1 24th of a second. And so you want your shutter speed to be half that. And so if you're shooting in real time at 24 frames per second, your shutter speed is going to be one over 48, which we see down here. You basically take the frame rate and just double that number, and that's going to be your shutter speed. Um, so if you're shooting at slow-mo, 60 frames per second, you shoot at one 120th of a shutter. And basically the reason you do that is because the, the more frames that are being captured every second, you want your shutter speed to be that much faster so that your camera's not waiting on the shutter because I'm sure you all have shot photos where your shutter speed is a little too slow. If you're trying to shoot, you know, a rapid burst, um, or like Linda with the woodpeckers or bumblebees, if that shutter speed is not high enough, there's just going to be a bunch of motion blur and you'll miss that moment. So when we're shooting at faster shutter speeds, almost like burst mode on a still camera, you want to be at, or shooting at higher frame rates, sorry, you want to be at a higher shutter speed just to make sure that each one of those frames is coming out nice and crisp. Um, so, to boil it down again for frame rate, usually in 24, and our shutter speed is usually one over 48. Um, and one thing that you might notice on still cameras like DSLRs that record video is uh, it might just be one over 50 is as close as you can get to one over 48. And that's completely fine. That's a completely imperceivable difference. Uh, so for those of you who are gonna, after this, hopefully hop on your DSLR and switch it over to video mode for the first time. Um, if you get into 24 frames per second and you set your shutter speed, just set it to one over 50. If it doesn't allow for one over 48, and that's perfectly fine. Um, so there's also some reasons that we might change that shutter speed because 180 degree shutter, okay, doubling the frame rate to find our shutter speed, that's kind of the baseline standard. That's our go-to if we're doing standard things and we're not trying to kind of evoke a crazy emotion or uh, or switch up the scene too much, but there are some reasons why you would change your shutter speed. Uh, so for example, to, to create a dream sequence that distorts time or gives the feeling that we're viewing a scene from a character's memory. Um, and so if you use a slower shutter speed, it's just like we were talking about how maybe the, the hummingbird is blurred, but when you show a bunch of blurry scenes in the video, it's like every frame has some motion blur, or you're driving and lights are streaking. Um, you could shoot in that way and it might give the illusion that your character is drunk driving or they're running incredibly fast or it just feels a little departed from reality and maybe that's a flashback memory. 
Um, and so there's, there's some times like that where we'd use slow shutter speed kind of as an effect to convey a certain motion. Uh, whereas fast shutter speed, if we want to go faster than 1 40th per second, that's used sometime to just get rid of motion blur entirely. And so a really famous example of this is in Saving Private Ryan. Um, they shot in a very fast shutter speed. They're still only doing 24 frames per second, but the shutter speed on each of those frames was faster than one over 48. Uh, and the reason they did that is because there's no motion blur and it made it feel really chaotic. So there's these scenes of soldiers in the trenches and we're, instead of bullets being blurred, now you're seeing physical bullets and explosions and shrapnel. And it just felt really gritty and crunchy and uh, really in your face. So that's an example where you might use a faster shutter speed than the typical 180 degree rule. And again, this is, this is the stuff that's like as nerdy as it gets. So if this is kind of stressful or a, a bit of an overload, I promise it gets better from here. And I'm gonna share this presentation with Linda later on too. If you wanna kind of watch, I think it's like a 30 or 45 minute video actually that's linked here that really explains why is it 180 degrees? Where did that come from? What did that physically look like in a camera? That video goes into great detail about all that and is great at explaining it. Um, so if this has been a little confusing, that'll be a great resource for you afterward. So this is kind of, again, just something for you to refer back to in the future. Um, if you're trying to remember what was that shutter speed or what was that frame rate? If we're filming real time, which is just normal playback at a normal speed, we're gonna be shooting 23.976 and our shutter speed is one over 48. Uh, however, for shooting slow motion, we're going to be shooting about 60 frames a second, and our shutter speed will be about double that, one over 120. So this is just a quick little cheat sheet for you to reference later. And now exposure via aperture. That's also something you're very familiar with. Um, the, the confusing part with aperture, though, and finding your exposure when we move to video um, I kind of describe it in this middle paragraph. So put simply in still photography, we're typically wanting sharp photos. So on a bright day, it's uh, easy to use a fast shutter speed, like one over 5,000 to get a proper exposure. And that keeps you from having to stop down your aperture and kind of get rid of your depth of field. But like we just talked about on video, you really want to keep your shutter speed at one over 48 if you're shooting real time. And so what does that mean? That means you're letting in a ton of light into your camera. If it's a bright day, you know, if you're shooting stills, you definitely want to be faster than one over 48. That still might be a little blurry. It's going to be really bright. Uh, so to combat that, we used ND filters, which I'm sure a lot of y'all have used in still photography as well. Um, there, that stands for neutral density filter. It's basically like putting sunglasses on your camera. Uh, and what that does is really knocks down the amount of light entering your lens. So it allows you to keep your aperture open. So if you see here on the right, uh, on the top photo, that's with a pretty wide open aperture. I believe that's an F2. Um, so using an ND filter would allow us to kind of keep our aperture open and make it nice and cinematic with a shallower depth of field. But on the lower photo, that's closer to an F12. Um, and that might simulate if it was bright and I forgot my ND filters, I'd have to stop down because I can't change my shutter speed. Um, but then we, we lose all that nice shallow depth of field and Although I do love the uh, the Corgi cowboy painting back there. Sometimes you don't always want a deep depth of field. So if you're shooting video, be sure to check if your camera has an internal ND filter. And if it does not, I'd say to, to pick up a uh, an ND filter on Amazon or, or Precision or whatever your local camera shop is, because that'll, that'll go a long way in achieving a cinematic video. So tool number two, lighting. Um, this is one of my favorite frames from The Exorcist. I think most folks know this frame, um, but there's just an incredible variety of things you can do with lighting, as you all know as well. Um, and we're just gonna kind of skim over the top of what that looks like in video, because there's just a couple subtle differences from the lighting that we typically use in still photography. So when most folks think of a film of great cinematography, they're often referring to the lighting. Simple decisions can yield a huge impact over the tone, information, and aesthetic of a scene. Uh, so we'll jump into a few details where film and photo lighting differ. And you can see here on this middle photo, um, 
you know, something I love about photography is I can pack two strobes or a speed light into a backpack and they're battery powered and I can run on location and light something myself and get to a result that I'm really happy with pretty quickly with, you know, no, I don't have to plug into an outlet. Um, I don't need a crew of 10 people lifting these heavy stands and lights. So in photography, you're able to really achieve a nice photo with, I think, less time, less money, less power, less people, uh, which is a really exciting thing. But on video, a lot of that changes since these lights are now continuous instead of just an instant flash. They're huge lights. They're really hot. They're heavy. They require bigger stands and that requires more crew. Um, and so a lot of this, you can kind of make it as big as you want it. We still shoot a lot of things in natural light, which I absolutely encourage you to do. Um, but sometimes when we start to get into the bigger lighting setups, that's when it requires kind of what you're seeing here, which is a full movie crew. Um, so in still photography, like we were saying, we typically use strobes or speed lights and color temperature is kind of the main thing that we'll touch on for these. The strobes and speed lights are typically daylight color balanced or a little bit cooler, typically 5,000 to 6,300 Kelvin. Um, so even if you set your white balance for daylight and you're using an off-camera flash, you're probably going to get a pretty good white balance with a strobe. Um, and you know, like the, the Pro Photo A1 down here on that third photo down, those are powered by like AA batteries and it can overpower the sun if you're close enough to a subject. So you can get a tremendous amount of power from a very small power source, like a, a AA battery. Whereas when we move over into video, uh, this light here on the top right is an Airy M18. So that's an 1800 watt HMI light, which you know, has to use a magnetic ballast that weighs 20 pounds and the head's another 15 pounds. Um, and you can really only run one of those off a house outlet. And then you go have to find a different part of the house to plug something else in. So you start to have to be really careful of your power draw and consumption. Um, you know, don't, you can't put things too close to a light because it could catch on fire, which fortunately hasn't happened to me, but I've seen plenty of photos. Um, so that's a terrifying thing, but good to be aware of. Um, but in short, the daylight balance strobes that we're used to in photography are mimicked sometimes like in this HMI on the top right, that's a daylight balanced fixture. So we can white balance to daylight and use those all the time. They look great. Whereas some of the older lights, like in this middle photo, those are more of a tungsten filament. Um, and that's really been kind of the great divide for a long time in the film industry. Most lights were tungsten based. And so to use a tungsten light outside, it was kind of like when we used to shoot you know, still photos on, on film, you'd have to choose your daylight balanced film or your tungsten balanced film. It was the same with film lighting. You'd have to get a tungsten light. And if you wanted it to work in daylight color temperature, you'd have to throw a really dark blue gel over it to cool it down to be pure white. Um, and that cuts down a lot of light, which then you're having to rent an even bigger light just to get a daylight source out of it because you're knocking so much down with a gel. Um, but fortunately, there's been a, a bunch of LEDs that have come out recently, like Aperture is a big brand now. Um, and a lot of these fixtures are bicolor, which means just with a dial on the back, you can change it from tungsten to daylight or land somewhere in between if you're filming with fluorescent lights that are maybe 4,500 Kelvin. Um, so now thankful for LEDs that aren't hot to the touch. They don't burn a lot of power and they're bicolor, so you can change the color temperature on the light itself. That's those are kind of where I would encourage y'all to to be looking for is because I think the days of HMI and tungsten, those are kind of in the past now. Um, and LEDs are cheaper, they're working better. So if you find yourself uh, you know near a rental house, maybe pop in and ask if you could check out an aperture light or a Titan tube is another one. Uh, and those are really hopefully get you excited about what we're able to do with some modern video lighting systems. And so uh, kind of running over those two things that we just talked about, this white balance scale on the right, um, the key takeaway from this is for strobe work on the still photography side, we're really used to daylight. You just have to be mindful on video if you're renting a tungsten light and then you're trying to shoot a daylight scene, you're gonna run into some issues. Uh, so just be really aware of the color temperature of the lights that you're using when you're starting to dive into video because it, 
and becomes a little more pronounced than in the still photo world. And now um, to discuss, you know, what happens in front of that light, we put a light up on a stand. We're still going to want to probably shape it, soften it, distort it, just like we do in still photography with a soft box. Um, here's a few ways that we do that. So solids or floppies are what we see here in this left photo. It's essentially a four foot by four foot sheet of duvetine or black cloth that has another four foot sheet that can hang down. And we use that a lot for blocking lights or for negative fill, like in the bottom right, uh, you can see this unnecessarily angry gentleman uh, is pretty flat lit on the left. And then on the right, he's got uh, some negative fill from a floppy uh, on the right side of our frame. So that just adds some contour and some shape to the shadows and just helps give, uh, you know, it communicates a mood. First off, I think it aligns with the spatial expressions better than being flat lit. But it also just gives a dimensionality and a certain depth to an image that helps it feel more cinematic. Uh, second off, diffusion. Again, this is just like a softbox, but in video, since the lights are usually pretty huge and they burn bright, we can rarely attach something to the light like we do a softbox on a on a photo strobe. Uh, so oftentimes our diffusion is in a six by six or eight by eight or twelve by twelve foot panel. Um, it's just stretched in a metal frame like this. So I think the one in this photo is called light grid. Um, that's a common diffusion that we use, light grid or full grid or muslin. Um, but those are all ways that we just kind of soften the quality of light and create nicer shadows. Cookies. This is a fun one. I didn't believe they were called this. I thought my professor was just picking on us and saying what we believe that they told us. But... They're really called cookies. It stands for cucaloris. Uh, and these are used to create patterns and shadows to simulate textures like windows, foliage, et cetera. Um, and we use these more often than you'd think. And if you think back to a lot of film noirs like Maltese Falcon or um, even Citizen Kane, there's a lot of these grand shadows cast on the wall that make it look like there's a huge uh, you know, window pane just off screen or and there's blinds like here on the right photo. Um, so this is kind of qualified as a modifier that you put in front of the light to help cast a certain a certain texture or, or shadow pattern. And next, I think probably my favorite composition and camera movement. So as a photographer, uh, you know, beginning to explore the world of film and video, I think this is the most exciting aspect of cinematography because this is really what differentiates it the most is when you take a still photo, you know you can have some implied visual movement. If a character is leaning in a certain direction, there's motion blur, um, you know, we can imply that there's a certain amount of motion, but when you move to video, now you can physically move a camera through space uh, and really interact with the audience in a way that I think feels like you're unlocking a whole other world beyond what we're able to do in photography typically. Um, and so, not to downplay photography because I think, you know, there's been a, a ton of photos that I can think of that tell incredible stories, whether it's on the left, it's the kid's father going off to war or in the middle, this is a successful open heart surgery that took like 30 hours and you can see the tech in the right corner just passed out um, or this famous photo on the right hand side and some protests. Um, and so taking the ability to, to capture a story in a single image, and now realizing that you're taking 24 photos every second, you know, sometimes even over an hour long if it's a feature film, there's just so much opportunity to create a mood or communicate something visually. Um, and there's so many tools that we have available to us to really define how we're introducing our audience to certain parts of the story. Uh, and, and when you choose to do those, when you're going to reveal a plot point or reveal a character's turn, um, you know, maybe they had been lit brightly with a light directly in their eyes. So you see a reflection, but then that character turns and all of a sudden they're lit differently and there's no sparkle in their eye. Um, there's so many different ways that we can employ these techniques to change kind of subliminally what the viewer is thinking about a character or a location. Um, so again, you can tell this is one of my favorite parts of this. Um, so before we dive into the reasons that we would move cameras differently or mount them, uh, we're going to talk about how we mount the cameras in different scenarios. So most common that you're probably very familiar with is tripod or often called sticks. Uh, it's a good 
stable shot. A lot of times we, there could be a certain amount of motion in frame where if the camera is moving, it might just be overwhelming. So we just lock off the camera and let a scene do its thing. Um, there's also a scene that we're going to play here in just a bit uh, from Silence of the Lambs that uses a lot of locked off shots in a very compelling way um, because there's a certain stillness and forcing the viewer to just be static and focused can sometimes be terrifying or it can be completely calming and peaceful. Uh, but allowing the composition within that locked off shot can really dictate which, which direction you're going. And so similar to tripod, but now on wheels, we have the dolly or slider. Um, this is kind of like a mini railroad track for the camera. And this allows us to move the camera, you know, in and out, side to side. We could put our track diagonally. They also make curved tracks. So, um, you know, sometimes if a character is having a sudden realization, you could have a circular dolly track around them and have the, the camera kind of orbiting around them with them in the center of the frame, always keeping on their face. Um, so there's a bunch of different kind of reasons that we'd use Dolly, but uh, I, I love the way that people have employed it to have certain reveals. Like I think when uh, The Shining was first shown in theaters, there's a certain shot where um, it's when he, he comes back to the hotel room and there's that terrifying woman in the bedroom, but uh, they framed it so that you just see someone's legs through this door frame sticking out the edge of a bed. Uh, and they could have framed it centered on the doorway so you could see the entire woman, but instead you just saw kind of the edge of her legs and the whole crowd and the audience physically leaned in their chair uh, trying to see through that door frame. And so it's just one example of how you can choose composition to really actually get a physical reaction out of an audience, uh, which I think is, is fascinating as you start to imagine the possibilities with cinematography. And then, uh, you know, still having some motion, but hopping off of the dolly, we often go handheld or shoulder rig. Uh, so while a dolly allows us to move on the track, creating stable dimensional moves through the set, that's the wrong text. We're able to pop off and go shoulder rig and have more of a, a handheld feel. And sometimes, you know, that can feel like in the shot on the right, um, it can really immerse the viewer into the narrative or make you feel like you're right there with the character walking with them because there's that kind of human sway as you walk with the camera. Um, but it can be a really immersive method of camera movement, but it can also be like born supremacy where it's so shaky and crazy that, you know, some people have to leave the theater because they think they're going to pass out. Um, so you can employ it in kind of a variety of intensities, I'd say. Uh, but it's a super common and compelling way to to operate the camera. Plus, it's fun, you know, just like with still photography, to be able to hold the camera and quickly point it where you want it, get it high, get it low. Um, so this is a really common way that we mount the camera. And steady camera gimbal. Um, this is a little more recent. Uh, the first one of these was actually also developed, I believe, either on Rocky or The Shining. Um, but this is essentially you balance all axes of the camera on one specific pivot point, and that allows you to have a completely balanced camera. Um, so say you're running up the stairs or orbiting around a person. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, mom. Too. Oh, there she goes. But uh, we, uh, we often hop on a gimbal if we're going to be moving through space or, uh, you know, if someone's going to be running, but you kind of want that stability that you had on the dolly and not quite the handheld shake, you can hop on a gimbal or a steady cam uh, and really have this nice, smooth, calculated movement that maybe that communicates that the character themselves is really stable. This is decisive, a calm, calculated walk through a hallway compared to a shaky handheld walk. Um, so there's plenty of reasons to use this, but it's often used when you want to move the camera stably through space and you can't have a dolly track, you know, going upstairs or going around the corner. So now that we've reviewed kind of the technical approach for those three key tools, uh, we're going to go ahead and dive into the ways that we can employ those to create a visual narrative. So the scene breakdown, uh, we're going to dissect a famous scene. And I wrote dissect before I realized that was kind of a poor choice of words, uh, but Clarice and Hannibal's first meeting from Science of the Lambs. I'm going to try and play this clip and let me know if you're getting any audio. I'm not getting audio. Gotcha. Oh, boy. 
Oh, well. We'll, uh, we'll kind of run through. The, the important part is basically the lighting and the camera movement. Um, so we'll kind of dive through those in just a moment. So as they continue to meet, there's kind of a variety of super interesting things going on that I'll, I'll come back and review this and point them out. Um, but noticing the way that the lighting is different between the two of them, how she walks through shadow, how that motivates this dolly in on him as he walks into light. Um, there's a bunch of tools at play right now that can make what feels like maybe a tense but kind of mundane scene it's really masterful under the surface of it. Uh, there's subliminally a lot of things going on. So I'm gonna kind of break down a couple of the key elements of this that really help um, push this visual narrative forward beyond just the, the fantastic acting that's going on as well. Are you able to see this still? Yes. Perfect. Um, There we go. Um, so yeah. Um, so if we imagine ourselves as the cinematographer of this film, uh, after reading the script and this scene, I, would, I think it would cue us into a few key elements of the kind of who, what, and where. Uh, the who is our hero character, Clarice, and the infamous Hannibal Lecter opposite. Uh, what, that's them meeting for the first time, and where, it's clearly a prison with Hannibal behind glass. Uh, and you know, in the film, a lot of things really build to this point. There's a lot of mystery and a lot of scary things happening uh, that even allow us to get to this point in the film as a viewer. And so that creates a lot of opportunity for us to employ these tools and really maximize that opportunity. And so as we have these, these, uh, these three goals, um, I think the purpose of this scene is we're showcasing Hannibal as this evil serial killer. We're putting our viewer in Clarice's shoes, uh, meeting this man for the first time. And we really have to establish the intensity within the dialogue because that's, that's the intensity that Clarice's character is clearly feeling. And one thing that we need to remember, and this, this isn't just for horror films or tense scenes or moody dramas, uh, but the unknown is one of our greatest currencies as visual storytellers. Uh, and spending it sparingly is really important. And I think what I mean by that is we as the cinematographers or photographers have access to the backstory. We know where this is going. We know how this is gonna develop, um, you know, who's gonna live, who's gonna die. And if you show your hand too soon, you lose the audience's attention, you lose that suspense. And so throughout you developing a scene or even telling a story in one photograph, uh, I encourage you to be really mindful of when you choose to showcase certain elements or story beats uh, because once you've shown those you can't take them back but once the viewer kind of gets the point of it they're moving on to the next thing um, so with every shot be really mindful of kind of how many eggs you have left in your basket and how many you're giving away with this shot because uh, that kind of restraint i think goes a long way in maintaining the viewer's attention um, and ultimately just creating a better a better film so for this breakdown, uh, the first thing that we're, the first goal that we had was showcasing Hannibal as an evil serial killer. Uh, and so I kind of showcase how we'd use those three tools that we talked about earlier to do so. Uh, so exposure, we want to underexpose, that creates mystery, that creates shadows. Um, you know, when things are really bright, we're able to get more of the information. We can see more of what's in the room. We can see if he's holding something. So by underexposing, we're able to just contain a little bit more of that mystery which also plays into lighting. Um, you can see here that we're lighting him from above and it does a few things, um, you know, that keeps him as the brightest object in the frame. So your eye goes directly to him. It also casts shadows down his face, kind of like mine right now, I'm realizing. Um, but that removes the sparkle from his eye. It makes him feel soulless. Um, there's something really creepy about that. And you'll notice when we review the scene, 
that when I cut back to Clarice's character, she's lit from a little bit lower. And so she's got a perfect sparkle in her eye. There's not as much shadow to her face uh, because she's a character that we know and trust. But at this point, we're still wanting to showcase that this is a menacing serial killer. Uh, so we chose to light him above, which is really unflattering as it shows. Um, and then with composition and camera movement, we, again, we're kind of jumping into the scene, not fully knowing where we are, but starting out a little wider. Uh, we frame within the prison bars, so we know that now there's something between us and him. Um, we also shoot below his eye line. That gives him a little bit of power. You know, if you shoot above his eye line, it's almost like a parent looking down at their kid um, or someone looking down at an ant that they're going to step on. It, it reduces power for that character. So a lot of times when we want to give power to a character uh, or make them feel a little bit larger than life, we'll take the camera lower than eye line and kind of shoot up at them. And that just makes them feel more grand and more large uh, and sometimes more intimidating. So our second goal is to put our viewer in Clarice's shoes uh, because she's meeting this man for the first time. And so I think the best way that they do this is, again, we'll kind of replay the scene, but to enter, enter us into the scene, the camera's dolling forward and it's clearly Clarice's point of view and it starts to turn as we get to his cell. Um, and that again, is uh, kind of that restraint that I was talking about. As the cinematographer, we know he's there. And we could have started out with a big wide shot that showed him in the frame just sitting there waiting as she's walking down the hallway towards him. Uh, but there's no suspense in that. Um, and so instead, we choose to force the viewer to experience this just as Clarice is and be just as nervous as she is because she doesn't know what's around that corner. Uh, so again, we start with a dolly forward that's kind of panning to the left we land and reveal Hannibal. Um, and next, another thing they do with composition here is they, they're shooting over their shoulder. Um, so you can see over Hannibal's shoulder and then over Clarice's shoulder below. And typically when we do that, it's a very common shot, OTS is over the shoulder. Um, but typically we'd give a little more space. You know, his shoulder would be here and her face would be here. And that feels pretty comfortable, but they've stacked them in this really uncomfortable way uh, that just creates a certain amount of tension. And if they wanted to, they could have shifted the camera slightly to the right or slightly to the left and given that nice compositional balance, but they purposely chose to stack them uh, because there's that tension and this is the closest they've ever been. And so why not put them a little closer in frame to make the viewer feel that? And then third, our final goal with this scene is to establish the intensity within the dialogue. And some of these things that we've talked about have helped achieve that too. Uh, but for exposure, they've opened up the aperture, which allows us to, again, keep that shallow depth of field and really isolate the subject, which in that top frame is terrifying to me. Um, you know, that's when we dolly in on him and everything else falls out of focus. And it really mimics how I imagine Clarice's character feels. Um, there's no way to look away from that gaze that he has. And so we don't want to give a really deep depth of field that allows us to see all the production design in the background because that's just distraction that doesn't help with the, the kind of goal that we're discussing right now. Um, so really keep that aperture shallow and have it just focused on the front of his face, directs the viewer's eye. Um, secondly, the lighting, we maintain some dark dramatic lighting ratios and keep lights snooted down to make the subject the brightest object in frame. So what I mean by that is if you had a large light source that was lighting him, but also spilling onto the background, the background might be just as bright as his face. And then it would kind of feel like a flat photo where your eye might not know exactly where to look first. But by keeping your lights kind of with, um, you know, different modifiers or using floppies to block the side, you're able to really just direct the light onto our subject's face. And that allows them to be the brightest object, which our eye is naturally going to go to first. And then composition and camera movement wise, um, this is a really strong choice. They have the subjects looking directly into the lens, which in the rest of the film is not the case. And so they're kind of breaking that wall um, where typically, you know, the eye line for the actors just off the camera. You don't want them addressing the lens because all of a sudden that kind of breaks the, the attention. But for this scene, it's their first meeting. It's one-on-one. -on -one. They had the actors like directly into the lens, which really lends itself to a certain intensity. Um, and they're shooting on a longer focal length. So now 
instead of being wider and comfortable, their subjects are filling the frame. You know, the viewer can't get further away from Hannibal. His face is full screen you know, in the theater. Um, so finding ways to use that, your different focal lengths or different lenses to really decide how much, you know, you want the viewer to be up in his face or how much you want them to be relaxed and separated from it and feel comfortable. Um, those are all decisions that we get to make as cinematographers to really make sure that we're telling the best visual narrative. Um, and then we'll notice again with the, with that same shot, that's when he steps forward, but we also dolly forward because if we had the audio, that's when he says that he can see her identification and ask her to step closer. And so by her stepping closer, that motivates the camera to dolly and even closer to Hannibal. And that's how we get this tight shot. Um, and so all those different tools that they use, again, it feels like a pretty simple scene. But when you break it down, they're doing a tremendous number of things to make it intense and make it uncomfortable and make it feel moody and creepy. Uh, and I think they did an incredible job at doing that. It was really successful by using those tools. And so again, I wish the audio would work. Maybe it will this time. I don't know why it would, but um, I'll kind of talk through again, what's going on now that you know what to look for. Um, so this is us dolling with her. She's a really decisive character who's been calm and calculated this whole movie. So we're on a dolly, it's really smooth. We're not handheld. Um, so we're dolling back with her. And then this is the point of view where we're coming around that corner. We get this terrifying reveal of this guy who's already waiting for her. And then we're starting to cut back and forth between them with these uncomfortable overlapping over the shoulder shots. I mean, that feels like they're right on top of each other. So it just makes it that much creepier and uncomfortable. We kind of bounce back and forth within those. Uh, he has to see her identification. And this is what brings them even closer. So again, pay attention to how he's lit here. There's no sparkle in his eye or casting shadows. As she moves closer to him, he kind of cracks a joke about how her registration's expiring soon. And that's what gives him light in his eyes. Um, so now we've introduced this kind of human side to him. They're starting to kind of have a bit of a banter. And now he catches this eye light that gives him a little bit more of a soul. Um, and so now you can also see they're not as stacked on top of each other with the over the shoulder. They start to get a little more distance between the two subjects and frame, which gives a little bit more comfort for the viewer as well. Um, and then as we play through the scene, we're still tight and intense on him, but he's still got that twinkle. Now he's being a little witty, uh, but oftentimes we're cutting back to now we have these wide shots where the viewer can finally breathe a little bit. They're kind of breaking down the barrier between them. Um, but notice that he's always separated from her by this bar in the middle of the frame. So although we kind of let the viewer sit back and relax for a little bit, there's still always that element of separation between the two characters. Um, so again, that's just one example of a fun scene that I think did a great job of employing these three different tools to really communicate the mood of the scene accurately. So it's kind of wrapping up uh, what I decided to nerd about for today. And I'm sure there's a 12 year old explaining it better. Uh, <laughs> but again, I'm grateful for being here and getting to, to chat with y'all for a bit. And if you guys have any questions, I could gladly talk about this all day. So feel, feel free to email me at chris at westfolkfilmco.com uh, or message me on Instagram or whatever you'd like to do. But uh, there's a, a whole other world beyond this that I could continue to chat about. And if any of this kind of piqued your interest, I'd be happy to keep talking. So Chris, you know, first of all, <clears throat> I purposely didn't see Silence on the, of the Lambs because of the, the <laughs> commercials that um, you just made me sit there and watch some of that and it just creeped me out. But I really appreciated the breakdown because, you know, as a viewer, I, I'm just kind of watching the film. I'm not looking for the the way they they utilize the light and that was really really interesting the way you broke it down and dissected it for me so i th i found that really kind of interesting um i'm not seeing any questions in here so let me give you guys a little bit of uh just a minute to throw that in there um gosh um let me see here uh let's see here 
So Sean's saying, great work tonight, Chris. So much great and very helpful information. Hi, Sean in Dallas. Um, so is he, uh, do you know Sean? I, I just briefly kind of, again, through the, oh, through the interwebs, but um, oh, okay. yeah, so I'm he's grateful one of your, that he tuned in. So he's one of your stalkers. <laughs> I, I, I'm probably more one of his, but that's mutual, I guess. Well, um, so when you, let's say, I'll just, I'll play dumb. So when a client approaches you and says, hey, um, we've got this product and we want you to do something with it. Do they normally come to you with an idea or is it left to you to kind of figure out a pitch for them that, you know, helps them um, kind of get the visual? How, how does that start? That's a great question. Um, it's, it's kind of a 50, 50. There's, Sometimes there's brands that have agencies, creative agencies already aligned with them. Um, and those are great sometimes because they've already got pre-approved creative ideas that the agency and the client have workshop back and forth for months sometimes. And they hand it just to us. Uh, you know, they say, we want a whiskey bottle on a wooden desktop. And in the background, we want there to be, uh, you know, more whiskey barrels or something like that. And that's easy. You can kind of just show up and execute and, Occasionally, they'll have some input on, uh, you know, lighting or aesthetic, but oftentimes that's just left up to us. Um, we kind of create the scene that has the production design elements that they've requested, and then they let us put our spin on it. But other times, we work a lot, you know, direct to client, and a lot of those folks are, um, you know, still young businesses that maybe don't have a full internal marketing team. They just know that they need assets for Instagram, or they're trying to build out their website for the first time or launch a Kickstarter. Uh, and for a lot of those, we will go back and forth with them and kind of identify their main goals, um, you know, timeline and budget to figure out how much can we do, and then identify the best way to communicate that, whether it's a really approachable product or it feels cutting edge or it feels a little mysterious because it's still in development and they don't have the whole product figured out, so they can't reveal it yet. Um, so there's a, a whole different range, but I'd say it's, it's probably 50% of the time we're coming up with it from scratch, workshopping with the client, and the other 50% of the time an agency just hands us approved creative and says, can you just do this and try and make it look all right? Um, yeah. yeah, I'm always curious, um, especially when you got, I noticed um, in one of, I think it was the first image that you put up there, it was, is it Desert Door? Yeah. Um, did some work for them. A friend of mine did some work uh, just oh, nice. at, at their at their place. You know, um, she worked with them directly, and it was just kind of like, wait a minute, I recognize, I recognize that. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, Kathy has a question. Um, how long do you film a scene? Is the lighting changed many times in a scene and then stitched together later? That's a great question too. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it takes probably 10 times longer than anyone would ever think. A lot of times our 30 second commercials are 20 to 30 days or sorry, 20 to 30 hours of labor, um, like two or three shoot days, which are typically 10 hour days, uh, occasionally 12 hour. Um, but to answer your question on the lighting, we often shoot the wide shot first because that's when we're going to see the most. Um, that's also, um, contrarily if you shot a close-up first and you lit it exactly how you want it but you know you're gonna have to cut to a wide shot you move the camera back and you realize all of a sudden my light's in the shot that can't be there and then you'd have to shoot the wide and go back and reshoot the close-up so we always start wide and work our way in closer um, and yeah that's exactly right we shoot the wide shot first we make sure that we pay attention to when someone drank a drink if they took off their glasses uh, you know if they exhaled their cigarette yet we have to keep track of all those things because when we cut into the close-up, we need to know that they blew out the smoke or their glasses are back on or their shirt cuffs were rolled up or they were down. Um, so there's all these different things. That's a whole person's job on set to keep track of continuity um, and just to make sure that we remember in every take, uh, you know, what were those elements that were different from shot to shot so that it, it matches when you cut from the wide shot to the close-up to over the shoulder at the other person. Um, and those are all different lighting setups. Like even when we light the wide shot, when we move in for a close up, now a lot of things are out of frame so we can scoot the lights in and make it look even better. Um, so 
we're always tweaking and finding different ways to kind of make each shot better as we work our way tighter and tighter. Um, Karina has a question. Um, what was the most challenging lighting situation you've worked with? And then how did you resolve it? That's a good question too. Um, actually desert door, I think was the most puzzled I've ever been. Uh, they have this blue deep blue bottle that's high gloss and it reflects everything um and so we we did a couple things um one approach was using doling spray which is in an aerosol can it's almost like hairspray but you can spray a product and it adds just a very slight matte uh, overlay on it and that kind of helps knock down and diffuse the reflections a little bit um, and so we tried that but it just didn't replicate what a customer is going to see on the shelf. And so we ended up building a box basically that had, it was a white box that had a little hole cut out in the middle that had stick the lens through. Uh, and that way what's reflected in the bottle is that white bounce instead of weird me sweating in the desert holding a camera. Um, and so I think working with highly reflective items like cars, it's a really tricky one. Um, Working with that and the bottle, that, that was probably the, the trickiest scenario we've had where we had to actually custom build a lighting solution just to get our reflections out of it. Okay. Um, Sean has a question. What are some of the things that keep you inspired or continuing to grow? Ooh, that's a good question, too. Um, you know, I think we're really fortunate to be in Austin with a ton of super talented filmmakers. Um, the other night, a friend had a backyard get together that, that they showed seven short films from seven female filmmakers in the Austin area. Uh, and all the women's films were incredible. And, you know, so much of our industry has been dominated by men. Uh, and we see a lot of narratives that are written by men and shot by men and edited by men. And so to see a lot of these full female crews uh, creating these narratives, it that was just super inspiring to me um, you know, to see these women kind of band together and kind of defy the odds and find the funding and get people excited about the stories that they had to tell. Um, so seeing the kind of the projects that don't have all the money behind it, but they have all the passion behind it. Um, I feel like those are always the folks that are coming up with ingenuitive ways to you know, mount the camera differently or move it differently or, um, just find new ways to do things because where there's not money, you kind of have to make up for it with creativity. Um, so I think narrative short films are one of the most inspiring things to me at the moment. That's cool. Um, Elaine's question is on the topic of reflective surfaces. Um, does it help to use a polarizer filter? It does. It absolutely does. Um, anytime we're shooting cars, uh, polarizers are our best friends um you know besides just for bluer skies it also knocks down the reflections like if you're shooting a car at the windshield at a 45 degree angle um, you can almost get rid of that reflection so if a manufacturer is wanting us to shoot a car specifically through a window but still see what's inside if we forget our polarizer for the day that means we're having to roll down the window shoot it and add the window in the post later and it's or just making more work for ourselves. Um, so yeah, it, the polarizers are certainly a, a crucial tool for us in the sake of that desert door bottle that I love and hate so much. Um, it's a full rounded face with a curved neck to it. And so things underneath it, things in front of it, things even behind it show up in the reflections. Um, so a polarizer did help knock out a decent bit of reflections, but straight down the middle is where you'd see me every time. Um, so that was the pain, but the, the great thinking of that is that's the perfect tool for the job. Okay. One last question. Um, Jason is curious. He's going to throw out a term called Dutch angle. Is this something you've used? It's something I've used, but I dislike typically. It, I've, and I've seen it used very well. A Dutch angle is when the camera's canted to the side kind of, like this, ah, I'd say. Okay. Um, so the way it's I super like to take photos, yeah. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's been used in super, uh, super effective ways. Um, to me, 
and like for example like michael bay will use it a lot in films like transformers or something um and i feel like it, it's a fast way to create something that looks uh you know off canter or unusual but i feel like it, it's more distracting to me than it is helpful um so there still are plenty of times to use it or occasionally we could do it if we we're mimicking a security camera um you know security cameras i feel like they're rarely perfectly level so if we're going to cut to a make-believe security camera that we've mounted in the corner we might put a little dutch angle on it just so it feels a little more organic like it's been bumped by someone or installed by someone who was rushed um, so there's certainly a time and place for it i just rarely find myself being able to use it in commercial work i'd say um just a couple of comments amy and sue have both said that they will never see movies the same now <laughs> <laughs> You've all been ruined. Yeah, no, I, I feel the exact same. It's like when you start playing an instrument, that's all you hear in, in those songs. But, um, well, there's, but, there's so but, much, there's so much more to it than I ever, you know, thought, you know, I don't, I guess I just as a, a viewer, I go in for the sheer entertainment, but, you know, just this couple examples that you gave tonight, just playing with lights and composition and, is shooting, you know, from over the shoulder, you know, it, it really does. Um, it's, it's going to make me work a little harder. So I don't know if I'm going to get those birds to cooperate, but. <laughs> I they would just sit still. <laughs> sit still, flutter, turn your head. Right. All right. Um, Chris. Yeah. There's a, yeah. My hope is that it, uh, you know, it's not too distracting to you when you watch movies, but it, it at least helps you start to dissect what makes a really well composed scene and what maybe was shot on a budget really quick without a ton of creativity. But there's so much to appreciate with so many great films out there. Um, you know, if you're looking for ones that are super inspirational, um, a really basic cinematographer by saying watch films by shot by Roger Deakins. Uh, okay. He's shot most of the Coen Brothers films, so. You know, some of my favorites like No Country for Old Men, um, that I could watch that movie over and over again. But there's he's one of the most masterful folks and a lot of cinematographers. He's kind of their, their favorite person to go to to study. Um, but there's just so much to unpack with his work. But yeah, I, I hope this gets you a little bit excited about cinematography, but not too intimidated by by all the different things that you could waste time on. I'm totally intimidated, but I'm still going to try it. Um, and then Donna made, a, uh, Donna made a cute comment in here. And then you add sound on top of all the other complexities. So it's a whole, it takes a whole crew of, of talent to create, you know, just a little bit of film. A little yeah, bit. I mean, you saw what the, yeah. imagine how intense that uh, Silence of the Lambs scene would have been if you had audio. <laughs> so that's a whole other world you can build. Well, Chris, I want to thank you for taking the time and coming and sharing what you know with us. Um, it, it, I really appreciate it, especially since, you know, you don't know me and I really don't know you except for, you know, somehow you, you fell into my feed on Instagram, which is, you know, I spent a lot of time there. It's, it's fun. I've met a lot of <laughs> really talented people and you certainly fall into that category. And I've been um, talk to a room full of people that you don't know. Um, I, I can't thank you enough. Everyone, you can connect with Chris at westfolkfilmco.com and give him a follow on Instagram at Chris Burke. Next week, landscape photographer Mark Goman will be here to share his presentation, Shooting Local, Unveiling Things Hidden in Plain Sight. And until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon.